Fab. Thanks everyone for sticking around for this. Um, my name is Owen. Um, I'm a digital learning manager at Cardiff University. I'm joined by Laura and Matt, my colleagues. We're going to talk about um, some. We've seen a lot of really big sort of external initiatives that are all fan that are fantastic today, just like the, the one we've heard about as well. Um, and they've got so much scope for, for really, really impressive change. But we're kind of going to talk about something that's a little bit more internal um, and a small but really important change that we made within our digital education team. So. I'm going to give a little bit of background um, about the team and about kind of what, what this was. Laura's going to talk about what we did and some staff feedback. And then Matt is going to talk about the success factors and our next steps. So a little bit of information about us. We were, we're now a central team. Before the pandemic, we were distributed in different academic schools across the university. And there's around 35 of us ranging from learning technology support assistants, um, learning designers, digital learning managers, learning technology, any, anything you can think of that has gone on job description that kind of fits within this sort of team, we've got one of them at least. Um, Laura and Matt and I have previously worked in clinical schools. Um, before the pandemic, I was a liaison for our Biomedical Life Sciences College, which covers all the clinical schools together. And in these roles, we had been exposed to quite a lot of medical content that, um, to be honest, without any warning at all, so my first job at the university was to go out and buy a nice video camera. So that's quite exciting because I turned up a few days later. I was really excited to get to use it. And I got sent to the operating theater with it to film people having surgery, which was somewhat unexpected and somewhat grim and definitely not something that I had been told about when I was going through the application process for the job. And that's fine. We, this happens when we get jobs, right? We don't, not everything is in the job description and that's fine. But in this case, we we're not sort of 100% on whether that's okay. Um, Laura and Matt have worked in optometry, so you can imagine the sort of stuff that they've seen. Um, and Laura's current role, uh, most recent role in biosciences includes work on modules about human anatomy um, and dissection. And again, not really in the job description. So our big central team is also in the process of replacing our VLE. And we have got loads of people to be delivering training sessions and workshops and things like that from in, in disciplines that they're not familiar with. So someone from music, social science is now working in medicine or engineering um, rather than having every single person do one of every single workshop and things so part another big part of our role involves coordinating our support hub which is an email based um help desk really uh, made up of junior members of the team um who don't have a lot of experience working closely with learning content that's not really part of their role they're on the edge of the technical education tech side of things and we would realize there's quite a good chance of someone who's quite happy working with content in their discipline or sort of generic content is going to end up actually working on something they've not experienced before. And it might be something that makes them quite uncomfortable and that they wouldn't be expecting to work on. Um, and then we realized, actually, that's not just our support team. That's, that's everyone in our 35-person team. And I'm convinced that it's more wide across the university as well. Um, but what I mean by content that makes people uncomfortable is like, it's really easy to imagine in medicine. Um, but the more we reflected on our experience, we realized actually it's probably more of an individual thing than a kind of conceptual thing or a discipline thing. Um, so I've given some examples here that are, because it's quite hard to explain them without saying about things that are quite distressing. So I've given some examples that you might hear about in the news and you can just extrapolate those if you, if you want to or not. So maybe you're asked to help edit a podcast on end of life care, or palliative care. That's 99% of the time, that's probably okay. But what if that comes in the week of an anniversary of someone that you know that's passed away? Maybe, maybe that's not something you want to be working on then. But if we go outside of medicine, what about engineering, working on content that explains what happens to a car when it's in a car crash? Same, same thing. Looking at journalism, discussing the ethics of printing photos of what happens when small boats capsize. Real example from, from a university. Um, law, creating e-learning content for criminal cases that discuss things that maybe you don't want to think about, maybe you don't want to read about. So I think that kind of gives, a, gives a examples enough to show that this is a bit more wider than, than maybe we think or maybe we thought about. And we could, it took us a long time to think of these examples. It was only when some of them actually came up. That we realized how widespread this might be um but actually is this actually important so i think it is we think it is but when we asked our team about this to find out what they thought so you can read the the actual information specifically on the slides but um anything in kind of red or pink is something that i consider is something we didn't want to happen so 
Most of our team, almost all of our responses indicated they'd encountered content that made them uncomfortable at least once, with most of them saying more than once in their career as digital education professionals, either at Cardiff or elsewhere. Um, almost everyone said they encountered it as part of their role rather than by accident, because we didn't want to include things like if somebody walked into a lecture theatre and there's something going on, that, that's not the same thing. Um, and again, most people said there was no expectation that they um, made clear to them before they took the role that they would encounter this sort of content and that it wasn't implied either. Um, so when they did encounter it, encounter it um, we asked them if they were able to step away or if they were able to carry on. And most of them, unfortunately, said that they were expected to carry on. There's some quotes on here. Um, lots of people were saying, oh, we just had to grin and bear it and deal with it just like I had to. Um, and finally, we asked if they'd seen content that they would make other people uncomfortable, even if they were okay with it. And as you can see, the majority of people said yes, at least occasionally, if not more than once. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Laura now to talk about what we did. I'm going to give you this Thanks, control and try and unclip this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about more about what we actually did to get this project started. So the initial uh, focus for the project, it was around empowering individuals. We wanted people to come away from this feeling empowered and that they felt they could step away from something that they felt uncomfortable with, even if it was an anticipatory situation. Now, this isn't a research project. This is about people but we still had a measure of success. And our measure of success was that if one person used this resource in a positive way and it meant that they could step away, then we consider that to be a success. So how do we actually provide this information? So we created a, a resource and we just wanted it to be direct, compact, simplistic, very practically focused. So we put in steps that people could take to avoid the content and then what to do if that situa situation arises. And we incorporated uh, accessibility and inclusivity um, principles in our design as well. So in terms of dissemination, we made this in Azuti, just an online package. People could access through a browser and bookmark, very quick access. And we made it available on our SharePoint pages as well. So people knew where to find it if they needed it. So we've got one of the pages on here, just as an example, as you can see, it's just text-based, straightforward bullet points, straight to the points so people could get the information that they needed. So all staff had information around preventative measures. You know, prevention's better than cure. So what we wanted to do in the first instance is encourage people to say, before they go into something, what might I see in this module? that could potentially cause me distress, discomfort, and make me feel uncomfortable. So that might be based on the, the name of the module or what school it's come from. It's not ob always obvious, but take that moment to reflect. But then most critically, it's you can step back from this. You can say no, step away, tell somebody. Tell somebody, I do not want to work on this. You don't need to give a reason. There's no need for a disclosure unless you want to disclose that's completely up to the individual, but they can step away. And then if they get to the point where something's made them uncomfortable, this is where you get support for your well-being. We also included content on how to ask staff uh, in schools when you're working on projects. Is there something in here that I might see that might cause distress or some, cause somebody else distress? Because the closer you are to something in terms of your subject matter, the less you see these things. So sometimes people say, oh, actually, I hadn't thought of it like that before. And then they say, actually, yes, there might be something in here. This is what they might find. And then finally, there's uh, guidance for people who've been disclosed to where somebody says, I've been upset. And there's the just our university resources, where, well-being, where, where to get help. So what was the actual feedback and the impact? 
So we focus very much around the usefulness of this. And the majority of the team uh, surveyed said that for them on a personal level that they found it useful. So there were a few people who said they didn't find it useful, but this is purely subjective. So there might be people who maybe can look at absolutely anything. It's never going to be an issue. And that's totally fine. That does happen. But what was really positive and reassuring is that they all said they thought it was important, that we needed to have this, even if they felt that it might be important for some, somebody else. So that level of empathy that somebody else might find, that, find this useful. We've got a really nice quote here from um, one of the team that's uh, saying that you don't always know that this is an issue until this is too late. And this is one of the reasons why this is really important. And lastly, um, we asked how, if they'd made use of the resource. And actually, six out of the 11 people who responded to this question said yes. Now, coming back to our measure of success, our measure of success was one person. So for us, this is a massively positive outcome that they've no known it was there and they've come back and they've used it. So looking on uh, then to more deep diving on the impact, I say coming back to this confidence and feeling, uh, feeling empowered, this is moving towards more of a cultural shift. And Matt's going to talk a bit more later about the team in itself in that respect. So we wanted staff to you know, give us an indication of how confident does this resource make you feel um, in being able to deal with content and uh, uncomfortable content in the future. And for the most part, most people said, yes, it made them feel confident. But then does the existence of the resource make you feel co more conf confident about asking to stop working on something? And the absolute majority again said yes, which is what we wanted to see. We wanted people to come away and say, yes, I feel be able to say, I do not want to work on this. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And then uh, just at the bottom here, we've got uh, another quote uh, um, from a member of the team who said that this was a revelation because they didn't know that they could step away. They didn't know they could say, say, say no and that they would uh, prioritize the work over their own well-being. So for them, stepping away from this, looking at this resource, knowing that um, they could look after themselves and put themselves first was really crucial. I'll hand over to Matt. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about let's move on actually about what we think made it possible for this change to be successful. So the success of this policy we think is built on the existing flexibility in workload management uh, that has been practiced since we were brought into a central team in 2020. So as Owen said, we have around 35 different uh, digital education professionals in various roles in the DigEd team. Um, meaning there are enough people to step in uh, to support colleagues when needed. Um, and this established way of working has led to a great deal of trust between team members. And we've proven over time that a self-directed support environment works for us. So the eight members in the support hub team, uh, so these are the people that pick up um, queries from across the university. Um, they, they've shown for two years before we implemented this policy that they can be trusted to uh, uh, engage with queries based on their own availability, interest and expertise. Um, they deal with around 5,000 queries every year and all are answered within 24 hours uh, without the need for management to step in. Um, so, And since introducing this policy, that's not changed at all. And then within the wider digital education team, um, school partners can and have been uh, relied upon. They, they rely on each other to support each other and cover each other in sickness and absence for years. So, you know, this isn't an issue. Uh, we all know each other really well. You know, we've worked collaboratively on many, many projects together. So these ex ex existing strong relationships have made it easier for team members to communicate their preferences uh, and feel supported while making decisions that are best best for them, whether that's talking with uh, their line manager or anybody else. Um, and team members who support schools, they meet every single week online um, based on what college they're in. Um, and the support hub meets every single week online 
and everybody in the digital education team meets at least once a month in a whole team meeting where we discuss uh, policies in the university and whatever we're working on. So, you know, we, we, we can communicate about these issues in those meetings. So everyone in the team, I, I think we all have the same values. You know, I think the success of this is rooted in those shared values of empathy, respect and collaboration. So it's not just a talk and well-being gesture. And I think you know, Laura's demonstrated that that they believe that themselves. Um, so there are seniors team members that have worked in the university for 10, 15 years or more. Uh, in a variety of different schools and different roles um, so there's a broad range of experience when dealing with problematic content in a number of different contexts and you know these senior team members see themselves as mentors you know they want to support junior team members and they want to share their expertise um, so before the pandemic there was a central team but it was much much smaller so the majority of our learning technologists back then were based in schools and isolated so they would often go months without talking to any other digital education professionals, you know, potentially just in their own little silos. Um, and this meant that they felt as though they had to deal with content uh, that made them feel uncomfortable. They felt as though they didn't have a choice uh, as there was no one else to step in. So we think that being in this bigger central team with 35 members is, is I think it's been the foundation that's allowed this policy to work. So yeah, what are our next steps? So we want we want to raise awareness with academic and pro program admin teams by being an open and honest with colleagues when we come across potentially problematic content, just so that they think twice about uh, what they can do in their own practice to warn colleagues. Uh, and we'd like to go bigger, bigger and gather experiences from outside Cardiff and do some research with other digital education professionals and look at how we can make this something that is embedded as part of our roles, potentially, which is why we're speaking to you today at this conference. Uh, so we'd encourage anybody interested in working with us from other institutions to reach out to us, see if we can do some work together. Um, and finally, we want to look to see if this is something that affects professional service staff and other teams within the university. Uh, which means having conversations with people and in other roles and speaking at other events and conferences. So that that's what we plan on doing. Yeah, so there, are there any questions from anybody? Sorry. Questions? <laughs> questions, anyone? Thank you. It's really interesting um, initiative. Can I just ask about your senior leadership support for this? So if you took this to a really extreme scenario where you've got a module going live tomorrow with 100 people on it and you're having to work on material that you find distressing, would a senior leader back you in saying, OK, then that module can't be ready in time? I think so. Yeah, well, I mean, as part of our senior management team and the digital team, I would, I would back the, the team to do that. We shouldn't be at that point if we're at this point. So we start, We did think about what are the extreme situations? What if somebody picks up on something because of a value that we don't share and they don't, want, they don't want to work on a piece of content for a value that I don't consider to be something that is appropriate for the university? What if everyone on the team decides there's something they don't want to work on? But actually, these, these scenarios are so extreme, so rare, that I'd much rather have implemented something that allows the people that have benefited from it to benefit from it now and when we encounter that situation we'll deal with it then i'm feel, i am feeling fairly confident that we'd be okay in that situation to support that individual though thank you um so how's about your students so is it an initiative that you're planning to extend to, to your students is it something that you would like to address you're worried about and do you know if your students perhaps have been in a situation where they have seen something that yeah, so when we quite were, like it when we were looking into this actually there's a lot um there's a lot of support for staff um and i work with a lot of staff in the nhs there's a lot of support for nhs staff who are obviously seeing things on a day to day basis that are significantly worse than the sort of things we're talking about here in most cases um 
Students also have a lot of support networks within their discipline. So you wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect a medical student, they might, they might struggle with something they encounter, but there are support networks in place through the people they work with on their placements, through their academic teams and their program support teams, and the same in other disciplines. That support is there, is there for students. And actually, the, we, saw, we kind of saw this as a gap where students have got support, staff have got support, but there's a whole raft of people in the middle who encounter it so rarely that nobody's ever really thought about their support in that area. Oh, that's okay. So do no, you, online, oh, right, okay. So, um, and then do you, your team with your piece of work and how you support staff, do you communicate with the people who support students? So this is really early stages for us. That's one of our next steps is to look at where does this go beyond our team? Because it, I, I, I think that there's going to be professional services teams that are dealing with, in fact, I know there are in so biosciences optometry as well. We, we all know. Yeah. So it's kind of how do we get that message across without it sounding like, here's another thing for academic people to do when they've got a billion other things that are maybe more important in their minds. But actually, when we've mentioned it to people, they've got you know, I never even thought that I was sending you a link to this picture of this or sending you, this. it just, it just doesn't, hasn't quite been in people's minds yet. So we're trying to sort of raise that awareness and then look into where we might be able to make some more in interventions to kind of help. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh <laughs> Um, I was just going to ask, so obviously this is going to work in a central team, I can understand that. Um, in a, you know, a technical support team that is based in a clinical discipline, mm -hmm. for example, um, how might how might that work? Or do you think that there is an argument to put information and sort of trigger warnings into job descriptions, um, you know, yeah. because it's unavoidable? Yeah, and I think it's not... Um... When you say trigger warning, it's just like that. I know, I know, I we all know what we mean, but the, the more like, externally, that's our oh, universities talking about trigger warnings of that again. Actually, it's just about making it clear in the job description. Actually, this is a clinical school. This is a, you are going to be ex, you are potentially going to be seeing this, and it's just about being open. We'd be open with our students. We'd be open with with staff in our team that, that we manage about other things. So why not why not be open about this? Recruitment is notoriously bad with job descriptions that are just kind of a bit random and person specs just to get people into professional services. And yeah, I've, I think we haven't got any answers for spaces that exist at the moment, but going forward, we think getting into the job description, getting into the, the recruitment process. So people know what they're getting into is, is absolutely key because then you won't lose people either. If they really, if they're really upset by it, they're going to go and work somewhere else and you've wasted all your recruitment time and all your money as well. So is that, I know I've been asking the questions, but if you want to add anything, just let me know. Yeah, just one for me. I thought that was really interesting and a really good presentation. I just wanted to kind of understand, you know, when you say don't want to, you're not able to deliver something, do, what do you look at a lot of the alternatives and different ways of doing things? How, how do you get around? Yeah, so it's not so much, um, and I think that we might not have been very clear about this in 15 minutes, but it's not about not delivering something. It's about an individual. So um, the palliative care, Thing, the end of life care is something that, that's happened to me i didn't want to work on this bit of work but we've got other people to come in so i can go to someone and say look we've got this piece of work that's come in it's about this is there anyone who is quite is happy to sort of go and work with the team and meet with the team on that so it's it's not so much about not delivering pieces of work it's about swapping out the individual person that might be doing that piece of work with them or potentially taking them out of maybe the more intense sides of it so standing behind a camera filming what's going on you can't not look at what you have to know what's going on editing that podcast or whatever but that doesn't mean you can't build the module it just it's just about taking the intensity away from the situation yeah that was the last question great question. great question. a big round of applause for alex as well and the team and um,